Well, good morning. It's good to be in God's house today. Amen. It's good to see each one of you. Stand with me as we go before the Lord in a word of prayer. But listen to what David writes in the book of First Chronicles, chapter number 29. It's a prayer that he prays to the Lord after just talking about the goodness of the Lord. But he says this, it says, David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying this, Praise be to you, O Lord, God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Father, we give you thanks and praise for today. We thank you that we can be gathered together in your house and worshiping you. And Lord, would you come and invade this space, invade the area in which we're worshiping. worshiping. Father, invade our hearts, our minds, and our lives. And Lord, that we just experience the supernatural presence of the Holy Spirit today. We'll give you thanks and we'll give you praise and we'll give you glory and we'll give you honor. And we do it all in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said... Amen. Here's a warning as we get started this morning. This first song, may want you may want to like move. You may want to clap a little bit. You might want to get excited about the Lord. So here we go. Let's worship him together. I want to scream. Your goodness knows no bounds. Your goodness never stops. Your mercy follows me. Your kindness fills my life. Your love amazes me. And I sing because you are good. And I dance because you are good. And I shout, you are good. You are good to me. Nothing and no one comes anywhere close to you. The earth and oceans deep only reflect this truth. And in my darkest night, you shine as bright as With a cry of praise, my heart will proclaim, you are good, you are good, and in the sun or rain, my life celebrates, you are good, you are good, sing that again, with a cry of praise, with a cry of praise, my heart With a cry of praise, my heart will proclaim, you are good, you are good. And in the sun or rain, my 
Good morning. <laughs> For our prayer gatherings, prayer is important to us here at Life Spring. Join us Wednesday mornings from 6 to 7, and here Sunday mornings from 10 to 10:15. Both of those prayer gatherings are here at the church. Our July 4th outreach meeting will be held next Sunday. This will be more of an informational meeting, so please plan to spend a few minutes after the service if you're available. Um, to see if there's any way that you can help. If you have any questions, see, please see Pastor John. Sunday, June 16th, please join us that day. It's two weeks from today for our annual Father's Day picnic. Everyone in the church is invited to join us to honor all of the men of the church that day. The church will be supplying fried chicken and drinks, and we're asking you to sign up to bring a picnic side dish or a dessert. The sign-up sheet is at the information table, and Miss Donna, if Please see Miss Donna if you have any questions. And we also have pot holders for sale. This is a basket of pot holders. There is a basket of pot holders back at the information table. Miss Donna made them and is selling them for a fundraiser to help Hannah raise funds for a trip to Europe this summer. If you would like a pot holder, please stop by the info table. And there's also blankets that were donated as well for this cause. If you have any questions, please see Hannah. Amen. There's lots going on, and I know summer is gearing up, and you've got lots of things planned and trips to take, but don't miss out on what the Lord is doing here and what we have going on here. Uh, Kayla said there might be something for you July 4th. I'm just going to mend that a little bit. There is something for you here on July 4th on that outreach, and so we'd love for you to stick around next Sunday morning for that meeting. Stand with me. We're going to take a moment in a moment, and we're going to give our tithe and our offering and take that same time and take opportunity to say hello to, to someone maybe that you haven't done that yet to today. I opened the, the service today with 1 Chronicles 29, 11 and David's praise. David's praise is coming. That, that, those two verses of scripture that I read come after his declaration to the people that God desires a temple to be built, but not for David to build it but for Solomon to build it. David had some things that he had to wrestle through because it was really his heart's desire to do that, but God said no. But David had the luxury, he had the privilege of getting the blueprints together and raising the funds. And David stood there that day in this instant and he said, I'm going to donate my treasury to the building of the temple. And then he declared what it is that he was giving. It said, I'm going to give this much gold and this much silver and this much of whatever. Th of whatever. And, and verse number nine says this, the people rejoice at the willingness of David to give. And they gave freely and wholeheartedly. My prayer for us today as we take this time of tithe and offering is that you and I, Lord, would you give us the spirit of giving? Would you help us to give freely and wholeheartedly, not to the church, not for this, not for, but back unto you. It's a privilege for you and I to give 
a portion back unto the Lord. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity that we have. And Father, I pray today for a spirit of freedom and wholeheartedness in our giving. Lord, that we won't count the cost, but consider it a privilege to sow into your kingdom. And then we ask you, Lord, that you bless every gift and giver. And use it, Lord, in all the different ways that you would desire to use these gifts. And Lord, we'll thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can step out of your seat. Our offering plates are along the front. Bring your tithe and your offering and take a moment and greet another, uh, a couple of others while you do that. And I'll sing because you are good, and I'll dance because you are good, and I'll shout because you are good, and you are good to me. And I'll sing because you are good, and I'll dance because you are good, and I'll shout because you are good. You are good to me with a cry, with a cry of praise. My heart will proclaim you are good, you are good. And in the sun or rain, my life celebrates you are good. to me and I'll sing because you are good and I'll dance because you are good and I'll shout because you are good you are good to me hallelujah 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 I'm reminded of that old song that says, if you just set your sights a little higher, the things of this world grow strangely dim. Isn't it good to worship the Lord together this morning? Hallelujah. Would you raise your hand toward heaven for just a moment? We're going to transition and, and do another song, but we just, Lord, we are so thankful that you're good. We're thankful that your word is yes and amen. We're thankful, God. That, that your word doesn't change. And the things that you declare, the things that you promise, the things that you've, you've told us and revealed to us, you don't take back. You don't dangle it like, well, like a cookie and then, and then remove it right as we're ready to grab it. But Father, you've promised it and you follow through. And Lord, we're so thankful for that today. Lord, we purpose ourselves. We will worship you. No matter what the circumstance, no matter what the situation, God, we love you. Holy Spirit, do the thing that only you can do. Would you just take 15 or 20 seconds, use your own words, and lift up a praise to the Lord this morning.
I count on one thing, the same God that never fails will not fail me. never late. He's working all things out. He's working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy. It's easy to praise God on the mountaintop or standing in front of the dead giant, right? It's easy to praise God then. It's harder to praise him when you're standing in front of that mountain or when you're standing in front of that giant. And sometimes we have to physically choose. God, I choose to praise you. Doesn't matter what it looks like. Doesn't matter what 
might happen. God, I'm going to choose to praise you. Everybody wants to be on the mountaintop. The view's beautiful up there. But you know where the greenest grass grows? It's in the valley. Most amount of, the most amount of growth that you and I are going to experience is in those hard times when we allow the Lord to do what he's doing and praise him in the midst of it. Father, we worship you this morning. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy. Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you, all of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty.
is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great. the name is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Oh, Father, we worship you today and declare your greatness. Lord, we declare it from the top of the mountain, we declare it from the lowest of the valley, and we declare it in every step in between, because we recognize your greatness, your greatness in the midst of the battle, your greatness in the midst of the circumstance, your greatness in the midst of our sin, your greatness in the midst of the bondage, your greatness in the midst of, of, of everything that can come our way or situation we might put ourselves into. God, we declare your greatness today. We thank you that you hear us when we pray. We thank you, God, that you answer. We thank you because you told us you have not because you ask not. And so, Father, we just call out to you today. And we worship you because you're worthy. We worship you because you're worthy. There's no one like you. There's no one who can do the things that you do. Perform the miracles that you perform. Thank you and we praise you today, God. You're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy. We're going to transition into a time of prayer this morning as we stay in this place, in this atmosphere, in this attitude. If you have a prayer request, a need this morning, would you just raise your hand right now? We're not even asking you to share it out loud, but if you have a need, some sort of need, any kind of need, Maybe it's an answer that you're searching for. Maybe you need delivered from something. Maybe it's a physical, mental, spiritual. doesn't matter what it is. If there's a need, would you raise your hand? And we want to pray with you today. Anybody? Nobody needs Jesus this morning. No, I'm just teasing. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Don't be ashamed. I'm not, we're not even going to ask you to share your requests. We just want you to lift your hands this morning. Because God sees, God knows. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we're going to take these needs before the Lord this morning. Right now in His presence. Listen, the Holy Spirit is here. 
I believe ministering to every heart, every mind, every need, every situation. Father, right now in the mighty name of Jesus, we come to you and we thank you. Once again, we declare your greatness. There is no one like you. You are good. You are faithful. You are true. Lord, this morning we take these needs, the, the showing of the hand. And Lord, I believe there's some others here that excuse me, have a need and they've not raised their hand, but Lord, you see and you know all. And we commit them to you, God. We give them to you and ask you, Lord, that you would touch and that you would heal and that you would deliver and you would restore, that you'd break the bondages, that you'd restore the marriages, that you'd bring the prodigals back home. You're the only one that can set the captive free. You're the only one who can take a stone, a hard heart and make it soft again. You're the only one who, when we're running in the opposite direction, can meet us where we are. Wrap your loving arms around us and just say, stop. Be still in my presence. Oh, Lord, we worship you this morning. We declare victory in every area of our lives. Father, thank you. We praise you. We give you glory and we give you honor. We thank you for the testimonies that have come forth during this time of prayer. And Father, we're believing you for even more. We're believing you for even more, for greater things and greater things and greater things. Because you don't stop. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We worship you, Lamb of God. And now as we transition into your word, would you continue, Holy Spirit, to move in our hearts our minds and our lives. Change us. We don't want to walk out of this place the same way we walked in. But Lord, we'll give you thanks and praise for it. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, amen. Give the Lord a clap offering this morning. You may be seated. announcement to give you and then we're going to get into the word if you want to take your bible out and turn with me to the book of proverbs chapter number four that's where we're going to start uh, but quick announcement uh, some of you may know about this and some of you may not but there is a ministry that happens in the summer in the park every monday through sunday it's called the Lidditz spring house I don't know if you're familiar with that or not, but they serve concessions uh, in the park every Wednesday through Sunday from 11.30 a.m. until 6 p.m. And there are opportunities that you and I have to volunteer and help out uh, this summer. They've already begun. They start Memorial Day weekend and they go until Labor Day weekend. And uh, it's a great ministry. And I say ministry because that's exactly what it is. Everyone who works uh, at the Spring House are Born Again Believers, and it's run and overseen by Born Again Believers, and they do ministry there. Yes, they'll hand you a cheeseburger, and they'll give you something to drink, but ministry happens there. Every summer, we hear of people who get saved, people who want to be baptized because the, the uh, spring runs right through the park, people that get delivered, people who get baptized in the Holy Spirit, right there in the park because they came in for some physical food, and Jesus touched them and met them right where they were. And this is a ministry that's been happening, if I remember correctly, for about 12 years, and they're still running strong. And I know both gentlemen that are oversee the running. This is a volunteer opportunity. I'll get to you in 10 seconds. It's a volunteer opportunity. You're not getting paid, but you are investing in the kingdom. Go ahead. Yes. And any... They have awesome hot dogs and burgers. Let's talk about first things first. No. But all of the proceeds, because you, you, you have to pay for the hamburger, the drink, but everything that's raised goes to local ministries. Uh, so they're not making anything. This is not a profit thing. So there's opportunities. There's two shifts that happen every day. The first shift is 11 a.m. to 3 p.m., and the second shift is 2.30 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. So if you work the first shift, you help everything get ready and opened up. If you work the second shift, then you also help get everything closed down and cleaned up. So if you're interested, if you want more information, if you're like, sign me up, see me after service today. I'd love to get you in contact with those guys. Like I said, great ministry and uh, just love it, love it, love it. Want to make that volunteer opportunity available to you. Wednesday through Sunday. 
real close. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to get into the word today. We continue in our series, Peace of Mind, talking about mental health topics. And today's an uncomfy one. I'm just giving you that now. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to look at the person beside you, and I want you to repeat after me. So lock eyes with somebody. Lock eyes. And you're just going to repeat. I have two phrases that you're going to say. Okay? Here, ready? Here we go. First, who's going to go first? Somebody has to go first in your pair. Okay? Here we go. This is what you say. First person. Say this. He's not talking about you, but he's talking to you. Now the other person's going to say it. He's not talking about you. He's talking to you. And it's a really important piece of information for you to know today because if you, in a minute I'm going to ask you whoever does this, if you say no, you're lying. But this, this is a message that really hits home to everyone. Uh, there's some other things that we've talked about that you say, well, I don't really struggle with that. God bless you. I'm really glad that you don't, and I hope that stays the same. But here's something that from time to time we all struggle with. And I want you to remember today, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking to you. What do you say when you talk to yourself? Depends on the day, depends on the time, depends on the situation, it depends on whatever task is at hand. I know you talk to yourself, everybody does, but what do you say when you talk to yourself? I'm not talking about the normal stuff like don't forget the milk, don't forget the kids at school, don't for- that's important, don't forget the kids at school by the way. But I'm talking about the ongoing conversations that you say to yourself repeatedly in your mind. If you're like a lot of people, unfortunately, you get stuck in what some might call a negative loop. Anybody ever find themselves there? Please raise your hand. Now, I want you to keep your hand up for a moment, not to, not to bring condemnation, but to look around for 10 seconds. Seriously, look around. You're not the only one. And I think that's important for us because the enemy loves in these moments to isolate us. You're the only one who thinks like this. You're the only one. And so what do we do? We retract. And then we get stuck in the loop. You continue to talk about things that aren't helpful. They're even harmful. For example, when you drive in traffic, you probably don't think, dear God, bless these amazingly good drivers. Instead, you probably think something more along the lines of, idiots! Everywhere I go, there are idiots. In the morning, you might think something, I've got so much to do today. In the end of the day, you might think, I did so much of nothing today. Maybe you think about money and your negative self-talk is, I, oh, I am always going to struggle. You think about relationships and you say, I can't trust anyone. When you do something wrong, you might say something derogatory to yourself. You're a mess up. You're a failure. You're always going to be this way. The question is, is what do we say when we talk to ourselves? Proverbs chapter number 4 in verse number 23 gives us some insight. We're going to do a bunch of scripture today because scripture's where we need to be. It's my goal to start. I, I learned this from Derek's uh, uh, president at North Point Bible College, listening to a few messages and being there. He says we're going to start in the scripture, we're going to end in the scripture, we're going to stay in the scripture. And that's my goal today, is not to give you good words that make you feel nice, but to give you the word so that you and I can be what? Transformed. Above all else, Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. That's the NIV. I'm going to read that same verse in the New Living Translation. It says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. 
guard your heart above all else, or above all else, guard your heart. Everything you do flows from it. It determines the course of your life. Listen, here's just something very interesting in biblical context. People generally consider the head with the brain that's inside of it to be the center and director of individual human thought and activity. However, the Bible teaches us something completely different. The Bible teaches us that the heart is the center. When the Bible talks about the heart and this part of the verse, it determines the course of your life. It's not referring to the physical organ that dunk, do dunk, do dunk. It's not referring to that. It's referring to the whole of your intellect, of your emotion, and your will. When the Bible says, so above all else, Guard your intellect, your emotion, your will for everything you do flows from it. Guard your emotion, your intellect, and your will above all else for it determines the course of your life. Your intellect your emotion, and your will is what encompasses heart when the scripture says, guard your heart. Guard your emotions. Guard your intellect. Guard your will. Why? Because those things will determine the course of your life. To understand the totality of what the scripture is teaching us, our life is shaped by the thoughts that we think. It helps shape the course that you end up walking or living. Psychologists call this the law of cognition. It teaches that whatever you think impacts what you believe, that what you believe impacts how you feel, and how you feel impacts what you do. Your life is always moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. Dr. Paul David Tripp, who's an author, a psychologist, and a pastor, says this, there is no one more influential in your life than you are because no one talks to you more than you do. kind of like that on one hand the problem is when we get into the negative loops we're talking ourselves into condemnation and we're robbing ourselves of everything that God tells us we are everything he calls us everything he declares about us Today's message is about silencing your negative thoughts. Let's pray. Father, we ask you by the power of your Holy Spirit that we would not be conformed to the pattern of this negative and sinful broken world. God, today transform us by the renewing of our minds. Help us to think on you what's true, what's pure, what's right, what's God-honoring, and Father, we pray this in Jesus' name and everybody said. How many of you would agree that the world is becoming more and more negative? Yeah, we don't even have to show hands. Chronic negativity is becoming an epidemic that's poisoning people's mental health. It's not just a practical problem, but listen, at its root, it's what? It's a spiritual problem. I want you to recognize today that your thoughts are incredibly powerful and you have incredible power over your thoughts. Your thoughts are incredibly powerful, but you have incredible power over your thoughts. Life moves in the direction of your strongest thought, but you don't have to be the victim. Hello? You don't have to be the victim. Romans chapter number 8. Let's go there for just a moment. New Testament. Romans chapter 
Romans chapter number 8, verses 5 and 6. When I originally jotted down all my thoughts and scripture references and things I wanted to say, I had 24 pages of notes. Don't worry, I've cut a few out. I now have 22. Just teasing, just teasing. Romans chapter number 8, verses 5 and 6. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their mind set on what nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. Paul's telling us here that those who live according to their sinful nature have their minds set on what the sinful nature desires. Verse 6 tells us a mind governed by the flesh is what? Is death. It's darkness. It's destruction. But a mind governed by the Spirit is peace. Only the Holy Spirit can give that to us. If you find yourself hurting, if you find yourself feeling broken, if you find yourself discouraged, it could be that your mind is set on the things of the world instead of the things of God. That's a possibility. That may not apply to every situation you find yourself in, but it is a possibility. I've shared this before. When we were in the midst of COVID, I found myself listening more to the news and the reports over the television than I did finding myself in God's Word. I'm not proud of it, but that's the reality. And if we're not careful to guard our intellect, our will, and our emotions, we find ourselves sucked out of the hands of God and putting ourselves somewhere that it does, we don't belong. Why is negativity so toxic? At its root, we need to understand that you and I have what's called a negativity bias. We're biased towards those things that are negative. For example, what spreads faster on social media, something positive or something negative? On any news app that you have, which stories get more likes, clicks, and reads, the negative ones or the positive ones? Back when newspapers were more popular... <laughs> The, the uh, saying in the media industry was, if it bleeds, it leads. Those are the best stories. If it's negative, people will read it. If it bleeds, it leads. It's going to be a top story. Listen, if you have a presentation, let me, let me hone down a little more personal. If you have a presentation, let's say for work, and you're really nervous about it, you do the presentation, you do a good job, and afterwards, five people come up and say, hey, that was a great job. Hey, I really appreciated all your hard work. That was phenomenal. Thanks so much. Hey, I don't know if you were nervous, but man, you knocked it out of the park. And one person comes up and makes a negative comment at the end of the day, what are you thinking about? Not the five encouraging comments that told you you did a great job, but you're meditating, you're chewing on, you're sitting in, you're floundering in the negative comment, lamenting, beating yourself up, because that one person apparently, it was the only person, every other person told you they did a great job, but apparently that person and what they say carries more weight than everyone else. Paul says in Romans 8, 6, a mind governed by the flesh is death. What happens when you see, uh, when the things that you see online are negative, the people around you are negative, when most of what you say to yourself is negative, when most of what you hear about in the news is negative, when you choose to focus on the negative, why are we surprised that we get in these loops? 
We've talked about uh, the, the, the negative new neural pathways that our brain creates. We've talked about them in some past messages. We're going to refer to them again in some of the upcoming messages. But you and I have the power through the Holy Spirit to break those pathways and create new ones. When you focus on the negative, when you look at people in a negative way, when you hang around people who are negative, surround yourself by criticism, when you never think that you have any standing or clout or anything to say, and you're always thinking the worst, you have fallen victim. Our default thought is things are bad and they're only going to get worse. Things are bad, and they're only going to get worse. I saw some of you when I said that. You nodded your head. I'm not going to point you out, but you know who you are because that's how we're naturally wired. But praise God, we don't have to live that way. Praise God, we've got a helper, a counselor, and a comforter that helps us break that posture. Have you ever noticed someone, you're, you're doing something, maybe you're in a room by yourself, or you're at least often a, a, a space by yourself, and you notice someone come in the room, but you purposefully don't acknowledge them because you know they're going to break your routine, your thought, whatever it is. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Just the three of us. Good. But anyway, I'm going to continue on. We're doing something, and we know if we acknowledge them, they're going to say something in return, and then they're going to want to tell us about something, ask about something, and we're going to get thrown off track from completing. And so we say, I'm just going to ignore them for a moment. Let me get this last minute or 90 seconds worth of whatever I'm doing done, and then I'll acknowledge them. Anybody? Okay, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm just making sure. So many times, that's how we treat the Holy Spirit when we're in a negative loop. Because we're doing our negative loop thing, right? And not coming against us, because all of us have fallen victim to it. We're doing our negative loop thing, and we remember the scripture that says he never leaves us or forsakes us. We remember the scripture that says he stays closer than a brother. We remember the scripture that says he's life and peace and he's joy and he offers he's life and life to abundance. And, and we remember, but we say, hold on just a second. Before I acknowledge that, let me finish my negative loop. Let me finish my thought process. We keep the Holy Spirit at bay. We keep them arm's distance so we can finish the cycle because in some weird, twisted, sinful nature way, it makes us feel better. And the Holy Spirit standing there going, hello, I'm here to break the cycle. My word declares and the whole reason I'm here, I really believe, I mean, go with this picture for a minute. The whole reason the Holy Spirit shows up is because we have that thought. It's in there. We've hidden the word in our heart so we might not sin against him. And in the negative loop, there's a, there's a fleeing thought of God. Hold on, I I'm finishing my loop. Hold on, I'm finishing this negative circle and then I'll be right with you, Lord. Oh, my, my, I'm struggling in my mental health and I'm never going to get better. I'm never going to be happy. I'm never going to be in ministry. There's never going to be anything that matters in life. I'm always going to be here. I'm always going to be stuck here. See the loop? Negativity becomes your default posture. The mind governed by the flesh is death. The news consume you, the shows that you watch consume you, the lyrics to the music that you listen to, the social media you consume, they leave you feel left out, jealous, angry, less than. I'm going to list four 
basic areas of negativity very quickly, and then we're going to get right to the great news. First one is rational, relational cynicism. It's a general distrust for people and their motives. If you're human, you've probably suffered from this because it's someone, some point in your life has done you wrong. They've said the thing. They've betrayed you. They shook hands and said, I will do this. They, they did not do it. And that creates a distrust. You, you think in your mind, someone's going to take advantage of me. They're out to get me. All people are this way. And it taints your mind. The second one is negative filtering. It's just seeing the wrong. Even when the right is illuminated, there's signs, possibly even angelic choir. But you only ever see the worst. The kids are running late. They must have been in an accident. Listen, they've been late 37 times and they've never been in an accident. They're probably not in an accident this time either. Number three, absolute thinking. These are polarized thoughts. It's the all or nothing, black or white. If a man hurts you, all men are bad. If a woman lies to you, all women are liars. If a Republican does something, all Republicans are this, and the Democrats are that. If you make a mistake, you're dumb forever. It's the absolute. And the final one is blaming. It's simply believing that you are always the victim. The reason you are who you are is because someone else did something to you. And listen, there are some real things in there. Please, I'm not minimizing any of them. But many of these things, we loop negatively ourselves. There are some people who have done some very wrong things. And they've done those wrong things to you. I'm not making light of that. But here lies the critical question. Can we change? Can we shift? Can we get a new perspective? Can you shift from chronically negative mindset to one that's full of faith and reflects the heart and the character of God? I've been in places in my life where I would say to that question, no, I don't think I can. I I've been there personally. There there's no finger pointing. Remember, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking to you this morning. You might be sitting here saying, Pastor, you're like, you're like hitting the nail. I'm not talking about you. I'm just talking to you. And we all do this. We all have moments where we fall victim to some of these things. And even if you don't feel like you can change, even if you don't feel like you can shift, the reality is you can. But you can't do it by yourself. Yes, you can change. There's the good news. It's not always easy. There's the bad news. You're going to need some supernatural help from God and a little intentional work on your end. This stuff really matters. You might be sitting here to say, today saying, are you serious? Are we really talking about negative thoughts? Yes, we really are. Because it matters. Because it charts the course and direction of your life. Take a, one, a look at a, a very powerful illustration from the Word of God. Go back to the Old Testament into 1 Samuel, chapter number 30. Towards the beginning of your Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel. David shows us in this portion of Scripture what to do when you are hit by, blindsided by, or avalanched by negativity. 
Let's give a context real quickly before we read. David was having a bad day. Bad day is not cut at any justice here. That is not even close to the proper way to say it. But we're just going to use that phrase. He was having a really bad day. And then it got worse than you can even imagine. He and his troops come home from battle. They're, 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 they're victorious and they discover tragedy at home. The enemy force had burned their homes, kidnapped their wives and their children. David must have thought, man, it can't get any worse than this. Let's read 1 Samuel chapter number 30. I'm going to read, begin reading in verse number 3. When David and his men came to Z Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept out loud until they had no strength left to weep. Have you ever wept like that? Have you ever wept to the point that you had no strength left to weep? I just thought about it. Not this, and this, this little 10 seconds is not scriptural or the, theological at all. But have you really wept like that? Have you ever really found yourself in a place that you wept so much that you didn't have the strength to cry more tears. That's a pretty broken place. I mean, think about that for a moment. When I first read that and I thought that thought, like, yeah, I've been there. I've not been like that. Oh, I've wept. I've made some nasty, ugly cries, tears, snot. I mean, it's all been there. But I've never been, I've never been in that place. And then we continue to read in verse number five, David's two wives had been captured, Ahinoman and, uh, of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal uh, of Carmel. David was greatly distressed, not because his wives were taken. That was part of what caused the, uh, the bitter weeping. Here's where David gets even more distressed because now the men are talking of stoning him. Because, why? Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. So David comes and he sees the destruction probably from afar because they burned the city down. And then they get a little closer and they realize the women and the children have been kidnapped. In that, David processes his own wives and children have been kidnapped finds him place, himself in a place of despair that he weeps so bitterly that he doesn't have strength left to do it. And then the men rise up and say, we want to kill you for allowing this to happen to us. In the middle of his worst, and what I, I mean, David went through a lot of horrific things. But in one of his worst and lowest moments, the scripture says this, but David found strength in the Lord his God. He didn't have the strength to weep any longer. And then another attack, but David found strength. In the Lord his God. In the middle of the avalanche of negativity, he found strength in the Lord of his God. This morning I want to declare it's time for some of you to find your strength today. Not in your own power. Not in your own positive thinking. But in the power and the life changing presence of Jesus Christ. He found strength in the Lord. The King James Version in that same phrase says David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. For some of you in a world of chronic negativity, it's time for you to learn to encourage yourself in the Lord. What did David say to encourage himself? We don't know. I'd, I'd love to say he said these three lines, he prayed this prayer and boom, he found his strength. But scripture doesn't tell us that. But we do know what he said at other times. So let's go on a quick journey and take a look. I know we're running late, but this is too good to stop here. Psalm chapter 103. I'll go quick, but we got to get there. 
Psalm chapter number 103. You know this. Psalm chapter 103. David writes this. Book of Psalms, probably right near the middle of your Bible. Chapter 103, verse number 1. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise His holy name. Praise the Lord. Some other translations say, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise His holy name. Listen, David is not saying, I praise you, God. He's not saying that. He's not saying, God, I bless your name. He's not saying that. You know what he's saying? Hey, soul. Hey, you in there. Praise the Lord. Hey, inmost being, wake up. Praise God's holy name. Hey, self. Because, listen, we've already admitted we talk to ourselves. Right? So this is one of the good times. Hey, self, start worshiping. Verse number two. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives your sins, heals your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Hey, David, self. Hey, buddy. I tease you sometimes and I say, is this thing on? Right? Zach hates when I do that because you don't do that to the microphone. I love to do it just to get him going. But, but hey, are you listening? Hey, self, are you listening to what God said? Don't forget who he is. Don't forget what he's done. He forgives your sins, heals your diseases, redeems your life from the pit. He gives you crowns with love and compassion. He satisfies you with good things. David's saying, hey, hey, self. Remember, God anointed you as king. He chose you. He set you apart. He delivered you from the lion and from the bear. He gave you faith and courage to stand up to Goliath. Remember, self, he never leaves you. He never forsakes you. He protected you from the spear of Saul. Come on, my soul. Don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. You've got a lion inside of those bones. Get up. And praise the Lord. And then you skip verses 6 and 7, not because they're not important, but for the time of the message. And verse number 8 says, the Lord is compassionate, and he's gracious, and he's slow to anger, and he's abounding in love. And so David's sitting there. Listen, his home's burned down. His wife and his children are gone. And people are now getting after him and want to take his life. And what does he say? I'm not going to listen to that. Come on, soul. Let's go. You know the God who's called you. You know the God who saved you. You know the God who's delivered you. And if he did all those things back then, he's going to come through right now. Come on, soul. Start praising the Lord. And we say, good for you, David. And then we sit in our negative loop and we beat ourselves up. You say, well, I don't believe in the power of positive talk. Some people say that. I've sat with some of you and heard some of you say that. I've been in other churches and I've heard other people say that. But here's what the scripture declares. You have the power of life and death in your tongue. And it's really not positive thinking. It's remember the truth of God's word. 
that God's word does not call you stupid. God's word does not call you a failure. God's word does not call you poor. God's word does not call you destitute. He does not call you a bonded slave. He actually calls you a free slave, someone who willingly surrenders their life to him. That's what he calls you. You can call it positive talk if you want to, but you're not representing God accurately. These are words of truth from God himself. The Lord is compassionate and he's gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. Have you ever heard that verse before? David said it here in Psalm 103, verse number 8. He said it in Psalm 86, 15. He said it in 145.8. Listen, David wasn't very creative. He went back to the same truth of God. The Lord is compassionate. He's gracious. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in love. Come on, soul. Come on, spirit. Praise the Lord. Don't forget the benefits of serving the Lord. Your situation, it does look grim. It does look bleak. It doesn't look very hopeful. But you're not serving your situation. You're serving your creator. David's talking to himself and he says the same thing over and over again. The Lord is gracious. My home is burned down, but he's compassionate. My wife and children are gone, but he's slow to anger and he loves me more than I can fathom. So I can serve God based upon what I see or I can serve God based upon what I read. The choice is mine and the choice is yours. But I can tell you that if you serve God based upon what you see, you will miss the benefits that David talks about in Psalm 103, verse number 2. And I'm not talking about serving God because you get stuff. I'm saying that God calls you blessed because you choose to live your life set apart for him. And you miss out on the benefits of being a believer. You miss out on the power. You miss out. Man, it's too much to list. David wasn't even the first one who said it. Do you know who he plagiarized this from? God himself. Exodus chapter number 34, verses number 6 and 7. God declares. You don't have to turn there. I'm going to quickly. Exodus chapter 34. Where in the world is Exodus? There it is. I found it. Exodus chapter number 34, verses 6 and 7. And the Lord passed in front of Moses and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord is compassionate and gracious God. He's slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. God declares to Moses, this, who is, this is who I am. And David said, if it's good enough for Moses, it's good enough for me. Listen, if you find yourself in a tough situation, don't look for a verse, run to this one. The Lord is gracious, he's compassionate, he's slow to anger and abounding in love. You say that to yourself 15 or 20 times today and you'll remember it tomorrow, I promise. So here's a challenge as we get ready to leave. I want you to act like a cow. We need to chew on this word today. We don't... Why, why, why does a cow do that? He eats a mouthful of grass, he chews it, he swallows it, he throws it back up in his mouth and he chews on it some more. He swallows it and then he chews it, or excuse me, throws it up some more and he chews on it. Why? Because he wants to get every bit of nutrition out of it. Don't miss anything the word has for you today.
Romans 15, 13, may the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. May the God of what? The God of hope. May the God of what? The God of joy. May the God of what? The God of peace. Fill you over and over again. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Didn't say easy. Didn't say stress-free. Didn't say obstacle-free. It says straight. You'll know the path and it'll be easy to follow. Stand with me. I was thinking about an altar call today. What do I want to do? How, Lord, what do you want to do? And then I realized, you know, this is something that we all struggle with. So we're all at the altar. We're all at the altar right now. If you want to physically come to a different place than where you are, you can step out of your seat. I invite you to do it, but we're all at the altar right now. Some of you might be here today saying, listen, I'm stuck in a negative loop. And it doesn't matter whether you're upset and frustrated because your shoes don't look as good as your outfit as you thought they would. Or whether you've been so hurt, beat up, walked on, kicked to the side, that negativity has become your way of life. Again, not making light of it, but trying to paint a picture of two polar opposites. It doesn't matter where you are today, the Holy Spirit is here. He's with you. He's good. He's for you. He's moving. Will you allow him to move inside of you? Will you allow him to minister to your heart, not just the organ that beats, but to your emotions? To your will? to your intellect. We've talked about worry. We've talked about anxiety. We've talked about the misconceptions of ment mental health that even in, in the big C church, it still happens today. Here's a battle, church, that the enemy is ready to be fully engaged in to bring you down in your mind, to destroy who you are, to change the trajectory of your life as he persuades you to get your eyes off of the Lord and onto him, onto the situation, onto the hurt, onto the brokenness. But David found strength in the Lord his God. Father, right now, all across this place, I thank you that you want people to be free. 
for those that are in person, for those that are joining online, for those that are watching this days, weeks, and even months later. God, thank you that it's your desire for people to be free. That Jesus came to this earth and he died. He took the beating on his back for healing, for physical healing, for mental healing, for physical, uh, excuse me, for, for spiritual healing, for emotional healing. That we might be made whole. Lord, this morning, reveal to those who need this revelation, reveal where we're most vulnerable. For those who need to repent, Lord, help them to repent. Bring them to that place, Holy Spirit, where they say, I have not been following the word. For those, Lord, that those things have been done to them. Lord, would you bring a deep and a personal inner healing as those circumstances and situations rise the way you are always so faithful just to scoop them in your hands and bring healing to our hearts. Lord, we take that hurt that we have and we place it in our palms and we just hand it to you. And as long as, and, 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 and as you begin to take that from our hearts, from our hands, Lord, we know that you bring wholeness and healing and put in its place. That while something that may have been done or said can't be erased, Father, you can bring healing and wholeness to it. That thing that kept us down can now be the testimony of your goodness. Lord, in this moment, would you minister to each heart? Lord, renew our minds. Heal us. Change us. You declare in your word and told us to think on that which is pure and lovely and excellent and admirable and worthy of praise. You told us in your word to be a voice of hope and life to people. Lord, as those negative loops are broken, Lord, show us the goodness of who you are. As our souls begin to sing that new song of your goodness and, and, and remembering your benefits and praising you from the innermost of who we are, God, as we begin to do that, would you reveal yourself in such new and fresh and real ways? Would you renew our minds, heal our hearts, and put the shattered pieces back together? God, thank you. Thank you for who you are and what you do. Thank, thank you that when I say amen in just a moment, you're not done working. You're not done moving. You're going to continue to work in our hearts and in our minds. You're going to continue to show us the goodness and your faithfulness throughout the rest of the day, our evening, as we sleep tonight, and as we get up and do life tomorrow. Lord, help us to be open to the things that you desire, to not push you away but to keep you close. 
Now, Father, bless your people. Encourage them. Strengthen them. As we leave this place, let us be the light. Let us be your hands and feet. Empower us so that we may be effective disciples as we go into this world and declare the goodness of who you are. Now, Father, bless your people. Bless them as they go. Bless their week. Bless their conversation. And Lord, we'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory and the honor because you're the only one who's worthy. And we pray it in the mighty, matchless name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. Give the Lord a clap offering. He's worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Take some time in fellowship one with another. There's a Father's Day picnic sign-up sheet. Don't forget about those. If you're interested in potholders or blankets, they're back there too. God bless you. Have a good day and a good week. You are dismissed.